Toby Young, originally a journalist and commentator, associate editor of The Spectator, mostly known as the founder and director of the Free Speech Union, partner organization fighting censorship and cancer culture in Great Britain. You may also know him as the man behind Daily Skeptic, a popular blog commenting on woke ideology and freedoms disappearing from our life. Good morning, Toby from the Czech Republic. Good morning from London. <laughs> For the beginning, uh, could you please briefly introduce the Free Speech Union to people in the Czech Republic. What is your main focus? So the Free Speech Union is a membership organization that I set up three years ago. Um, and uh, it stands up for the speech rights of its members and campaigns for free speech more widely. Um, about uh, some of the work we do is lobbying our government um, to try and um, Uh, protect free speech uh, better. Um, some of the work we do is organizing events, uh, meetups, um, debates. Some of what we do is uh, publishing briefing documents, um, helpful advice, but, but about 50% of what we do is casework. Uh, so we have two full-time legal officers, two full-time caseworkers, and um, we come to the defense of people who get into trouble either at work or at university for exercising their lawful right to free speech, but breaching some written or unwritten speech code. So, for instance, um, we just uh, managed to secure a £100,000 settlement for a civil servant who was um, fired from her department for raising the alarm about politicization within her department in the wake of George Floyd's death in 2020. Um, uh, so about half the work we do is casework and the rest is various things to try and uh, defend free speech. And we're based in the UK, but we do have some overseas members as well. And we have sister organizations in New Zealand and South Africa. We're hoping that one will be set up soon in Australia. And my ambition is to have sister organizations across the English speaking world and in continental Europe as well eventually. So membership-based organization not focused only on digital platforms, right? And how large is it? Is it uh, in terms of your members' uh, employees? We have um, about 11,000 members um, and we have now 17 employees Uh, 10 full-time, seven part-time, and we have an annual budget of about 1.2 million a year. The next question is uh, obvious and not an easy one. Uh, how is it with free speech in the UK and how has it changed in recent years? Well, when I set up the Free Speech Union uh, three years ago, I thought that um, uh, things had reached rock bottom as far as free speech is concerned and that it had never been at a lower ebb than at any time since the Second World War. Uh, that was in February 2020. And almost immediately, things got significantly worse. So the combination of the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement suddenly meant that lots of people were finding themselves um, uh, piled on by outrage mobs um, for um, uh, questioning the wisdom of the lockdown policy or questioning some of the uh, political uh, statements of Black Lives Matter, such as that Britain was a systemically racist country. Um, so, uh, but how, how does the UK compare to America? Um, I think we're probably in a slightly worse place than America because America has exported woke ideology to the UK 
Um, but we don't have the equivalent of the First Amendment to protect free speech in the UK. Um, so I think things are probably slightly worse in the UK than they are in the United States. It feels to me as though the woke religion, the great awakening, which has been responsible for uh, many, uh, well, responsible for a large part of the assault on free speech that's taken place over the last 15 years or so, um, that hasn't really uh, found any kind of purchase in continental Europe uh, until the last uh, couple of years. So I think uh, continental Europe is in a slightly better place than we are in the English speaking world. Um, uh, and I think in Eastern Europe, um, uh, former communist countries uh, like the Czech Republic are probably better off still because they still have some antibodies um, left from expelling the kind of uh, uh, communist control system back in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, but no nonetheless, the kind of woke Maoist culture does seem to be now creeping into Eastern Europe as well. So it's pretty bad everywhere, but probably, I think, slightly worse in the UK than most other places. Very good point. I think we could discuss this for hours. Uh, our society in Czechia uh, classifies all the reported cases of censorship into several categories, content being one of them. What kind of content is most frequently censored in the UK. Could you give us some specific examples? You're talking about social media at the moment now, um, yes. rather than the mainstream media. You can go for both. Well, censorship in the mainstream media um, uh, isn't quite as bad, I'd say, as censorship in uh, on social media. We do have a state regulator here called Ofcom, uh, which regulates uh, the mainstream media, the broadcast media. Um, and um, during the pandemic, um, they were quite... Uh, 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 they did intervene um, and uh, uh, penalise a number of broadcasters um, for... Uh, challenging um, the wisdom of the lockdown policy and the safety and efficacy of the vaccines. Uh, but censorship on mainstream media isn't isn't generally as bad as it is on social media. And it's about to get a lot worse here because something called the online safety bill is currently wending its way through um, Parliament. And that will empower Ofcom, the broadcast regulator, to regulate social media. But uh, it's still pretty bad even before that 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 happens. Um, I guess there are there are a kind of a cluster of hot button issues um, which um, if you uh, 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 if you say something unorthodox about those issues, um, it's likely to be removed from a social media platform. Uh, and I'm thinking of um, uh, there was the lockdown policy. Uh, the safety and efficacy of the COVID vaccines, uh, whether there was any point in masking. So those three issues were hot button issues. If you said anything counter narrative on those issues, it would likely to be removed from a social media channel. And then you have a, a number of other issues as well, like um, climate change, um, the war in Ukraine, um, and um, election results. So it's, I think it's broadly speaking, those six issues are the big issues where there's a great deal of control uh, exercised by social media companies, often at the instigation of NGOs or state agencies um, sitting within government departments, uh, often staffed by former intelligence officials. There's an enormous apparatus, a censorship apparatus, which... Uh, uh, Matt Tybee and Michael Schellenberger in America call the censorship industrial complex, and they've done a good deal to expose this via the Twitter files and other things. And um, it seems to be a multi-billion dollar global booming industry um, uh, called, you know, it's the anti-disinfo sector. And under the guise of removing misinformation, disinformation and hate speech from social media platform, platforms, they generally try and suppress dissent 
uh, in those six areas. Um, lockdown policy, COVID vaccines, masking, climate change, uh, war in Ukraine and um, election fraud. Those are the big six issues. If you dissent from the mainstream narrative uh, uh, on those six issues, if you say something unorthodox, if you challenge the mainstream view, you're, you're likely to find yourself censored on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, the big social media platforms. Very interesting. Uh, I would say all of them, what you mentioned, we see here as well, although there might be some differences where is the main stress, because some issues are more sensitive here in Central or Eastern Europe, some others are more sensitive in Western Europe. But the principle is absolutely the same. Uh, you have already hit the point that the FSU is also involved in commenting on new legislation. And as far as I know, there is a big debate going on about the draft uh, online safety bill in the UK. What is its main purpose and what threats to free speech do you think it poses? Yeah, well, um, it's a very complicated bill. It's one of the largest bills that's ever gone through the parliamentary sausage machine. Um, and um, it's quite fluid. So it's constantly being amended. It's changed a great deal uh, since it was first uh, 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 introduced into parliament. Um, and uh, it's currently snarled up in the House of Lords at what's called report stage. Uh, and uh, the next stage is the committee stage, which will be this September. Uh, and a bunch of amendments which have been proposed will be uh, voted on um, uh, during the committee stage. And then it'll go back to the Commons. Uh, it looks like it'll become law probably sometime next year. And it's not wildly different to other laws um, across the European Union seeking to uh, regulate uh, social media in particular. Um, and um, what it will uh, what it will broadly do is it'll threaten social media companies with extremely large fines if they fail to remove unlawful content um, and also if they fail to enforce their terms and conditions. So um, if, for instance, um, Twitter says in its terms and conditions that um, anyone misgendering a trans person will be removed from the platform and it doesn't then enforce that rule after the online safety bill becomes law, then Ofcom, the regulator, um, will be able to fine Twitter up to 10% of its annual global turnover. So in addition to um, uh, incentivizing social media companies to remove unlawful content, and um, I imagine they will err uh, very much on the side of caution and over remove, um, it will be extremely, um, uh, uh, they'll, have a, they'll, have a, they'll also have an incentive to, remove, to, to, to enforce their terms and conditions much more rigorously. And the, the upshot will be um, a much more censored, a much more heavily policed social media environment in which dissenting points of view, particularly on that cluster of hot button issues, will be much more likely to be removed. So it seems to me that you have no Digital Services Act uh, now approved by the European Parliament but you have your own law uh, doing the same thing. <laughs> well, yeah, the 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 um, it, it will it, it's what it's it's interestingly it it is um I think um more onerous, more restrictive than the Digital Services Act. Um, I mean, one of the supposed arguments for Britain um uh, coming out of the European Union made during the EU referendum debate in 2016 is that we'd, we'd have the possibility of regulatory divergence 
that we could have less red tape, less regulation in the UK than in the rest of the European Union. And in that way, make the UK a friendlier place for businessmen and entrepreneurs who wanted to start companies. Um, but actually, it turns out that regulatory divergence in practice means that the UK is going to be an even more regulated country. There'll be even more red tape here than in the EU. And it'll be an even less friendly place for businessmen and entrepreneurs to set up particularly internet businesses. Um, uh, but the two, the Online Safety Bill and the Digital Services Act will act in combination in a way which will maximize censorship. So for instance, in the DSA, uh, there is a requirement for uh, licensed social media companies to stipulate in their terms and conditions that they will remove misinformation and disinformation. Um, that isn't a stipulation in the online safety bill, but the online safety bill does say to social media companies, you have to enforce your terms and conditions or you'll face these massive fines. So companies like Twitter, I imagine, won't differentiate when it comes to their terms and conditions between European users and British users. So they'll just have a blanket stipulation in their terms and conditions that misinformation and disinformation will be removed because they'll need to include that to comply with the DSA. Uh, and in the UK, that will mean that if they don't remove misinformation and disinformation, they, they'll they be fined by Ofcom up to 10% of their annual global turnover, which is higher than the fines they'll face in Europe, incidentally. Um, and, and so removal of anything even faintly resembling misinformation and disinformation will will happen um, uh, to a much greater extent after the online safety bill is passed than it does at present. And it's, it's really a kind of uh, a gold embossed invitation to lobby groups, woke activists to lobby Ofcom to say, look, there's this misinformation and disinformation on Twitter or Facebook, meaning a political opinion they disagree with. You'll have to remove it um, or, 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 you, or you should find the company. So it's, it's going to be it's going to the combination of the DSA and the online safety bill will 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 create a kind of perfect storm of censorship in the UK. I find very important uh, your words to be heard by Czech audience as uh, we pretty much agree about the effect the DSA is going to have. Some people here are looking forward to it with the ambition it's going to be better for free speech, it's going to be better for regulating digital platforms, for uh, protecting uh, consumer rights here in the Czech Republic. But I'm afraid it's going to be worse, exactly as you say. But let's let's uh, wait for what what it's going to bring for us. One more thing about uh, Great Britain experience. I remember I was uh, shocked when I first uh, heard about uh, the thousands of so-called non-crime hate incidents. Can you briefly describe uh, this police practice and what the situation is now? So in 2014, a quasi-autonomous non-governmental organization, a Quango, uh, was created called the College of Policing. Um, and uh, it It, it quite quickly um, issued guidance to police forces in England and Wales that they that they they should um, uh, investigate uh, and record what it described as non-crime hate incidents. So a non-crime hate incident is when um, uh, someone perceives an act of hostility towards a victim. Uh, to be motivated by hatred of uh, one of the victim's protected characteristics. So if hostility towards someone is motivated by hatred of their race or their gender or their sexual orientation or their religion or the fact that they are trans, then it can be classified as a non-crime hate incident. 
So if it doesn't meet the threshold of 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 being a hate crime, but nonetheless is a hostile act prompted by hatred of the victims, one of the victims' protected characteristics, then the police have to record it as a non-crime hate incident. And um, uh, uh, something like uh, 250,000 have been recorded in England and Wales since 2014, which, if you work it out, is an average of about 75 a day. Um, and the police are spending an enormous amount of time recording these non-crimes. And um, it doesn't matter if um, an act of hostility isn't in fact motivated by hatred of a victim's protected characteristics. Um, it's sufficient that it's perceived to be so motivated either by the victim or even just by a third party, someone who's witnessed the episode. Um, and one of the really sinister things about non-crime hate incidents is that um, uh, they can show up on your criminal record. So if you apply for a job as a teacher or a carer and your employer carries out an enhanced or asks you to produce an enhanced criminal records check as a condition of employing you, the fact that a non-crime hate incident has been recorded against your name can show up. Uh, on your criminal record and prevent you from getting a job. So they can have a negative effect on your livelihood, on your career. It's something that Free Speech Union has been campaigning against for three years since we were created, and we are making some headway. Um, so um, the uh, Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, um, has just introduced a code of practice regarding the recording and retention of non-crime hate incidents, which will make it uh, which will mean that fewer of them are recorded in future and some of those that have already been recorded will be deleted. So, for instance, in this code of practice, which has now been approved by both houses of parliament, um, the police will no longer be able to record non-crime hate incidents against children, um, uh, which is which is a, you know, a big step forward. Uh, until now, they've been recording them against children, sometimes very young children, for saying things to other children in playgrounds. Um, uh, but it, it, it's a kind of very sinister Orwellian concept that the police's job is not just to investigate crimes, but also to investigate non-crimes. And if they find you guilty of committing a non-crime, to record that in such a way that it can show up on your criminal record. And I imagine there are similar things uh, elsewhere in uh, Europe, but um, uh, it, it seems to be particularly bad in the UK. And one of the reasons the police are so poor at investigating things like burglaries and car thefts um, uh, and do do very little about kind of antisocial behavior um, is because they're so busy, you know, policing everyone's tweets. Um, it is extraordinary. It's a kind of um, they've got their priorities wrong and the public don't seem to have much sympathy for it. And um, the Home Secretary is finally, I think, going to do something about it. But it's taken a long time to get that change. Well, crossing figures for your efforts. That's really sad to, to hear this, this practice, this experience. And now uh, the Twitter files. We often hear from our opponents that digital platforms are private companies that are free to set any conditions for using their service and also free to filter content that is uh, perfectly legal. The Twitter file scandal showed that the intervention of security agencies, the government, and also a clear political bias against particular political streams. So my question is, what lesson should we learn from this? And should be the platforms allowed to define so-called harmful content themselves and block it. Mm. Yeah, well, I think one of the lessons of the Twitter files is that um, an enormous uh, amount of um, taxpayers' money 
um, has gone towards funding um, various uh, organizations, um, some of them commercial, some of them charities, which have then been involved in trying to censor um, criticism of the US government and the UK government. Um, uh, and that that is effectively a breach of the First Amendment. But what 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 the U.S. government did is it outsourced censorship to these non-governmental organizations, which were funded by the U.S. government, um, uh, uh, which was a way of trying to get around the First Amendment. And I hope that's a loophole that in due course can be closed. Um, I think uh, more broadly, um, the effort by this ballooning anti-disinformation sector, the censorship industrial complex, which is global, um, but based largely in America, the effort to suppress what it labels misinformation and disinformation and hate speech online is, is part of a kind of elite panic um, about election results not going their way. So in particular, the um, uh, victory of um, Donald Trump in the 2016 US presidential election um, panicked global elites, as did the um, Brexit vote in the 2016 EU referendum in the UK. Uh, they thought, well, people are voting the wrong way. Why aren't they voting for Hillary Clinton? Why aren't they voting to remain in the European Union, and instead of instead of understanding these electoral setbacks as um, uh, a, a failure of globalization and of neoliberalism, uh, they interpreted these setbacks as just because people voters were being given bad information, were being led astray by bad actors. Um, and if only they were properly informed, they would vote for what these global elites want them to vote for. So this, this, the, the, these electoral defeats um, created a kind of panic amongst elites, particularly in the UK and the US. And so this enormous effort was made uh, to try and suppress um, uh, any um, dissent from their prevailing point of view on social media to try and prevent a repeat of these electoral defeats. I mean, it, it was an interesting departure from what used to be the kind of um, prevailing conventional wisdom amongst global elites, which was that the best way to deal with bad information, false information, um, was not to suppress it, but to uh, counter it with better, more accurate information. That, that, that's known as the counter speech doctrine and dates back to the early 20th century and was the kind of prevailing orthodoxy amongst liberal elites in the UK and the US for 75, 80 years. Uh, but in the last 15 years or so, with the advent of social media, the creation of smartphones um, and these electoral defeats in the EU referendum and the 2016 presidential election, the liberal elite has abandoned its faith in free speech and decided that suppressing these um, disagreeable points of view is the only way to secure better electoral outcomes uh, in future. So I think we're seeing a kind of that's that's partly why we're seeing this kind of global pro censorship movement, this very well funded international censorship industrial complex emerge over the past uh, six or seven years. Um, it's a loss of faith in the democratic process, a mistrust of ordinary people, this suspicion that they're being led astray by bad actors. Um, and um, and that, 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 that's, that's, that's led to the abandonment of this liberal counter speech doctrine in favor of censorship. Very clear. Uh, two more questions on digital platforms. Uh, should we treat them as media or as a common carrier service that uh, must not intervene into the content it distributes? Yes, I think one, one solution um, to the censorship problem would be to treat 
uh, social media platforms as common carriers, um, like uh, the post office. Um, so um, uh, they are obliged to um, distribute any information um, and not intervene um, and censor information that that's politically controversial. Uh, that that would be one way forward, um, but we're quite a long way from there, I think. How about uh, the payment processors like PayPal or utilities? Uh, should they be allowed to cut off our gas, electricity or water just because we share some unconventional information on social networks or look up for something on uh, search engines? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, PayPal uh, closed my personal account, the account of the Free Speech Union and the account of the Daily Skeptic um, last September with no notice um, and without giving a proper explanation. Um, and after kicking up an enormous fuss and enlisting the help of some politicians, I managed to get all three accounts restored. But we're now engaged in um, two, two fight backs. So it, one of the forms it takes is we're, we're complaining to the Financial Conduct Authority, which regulates payment processes in the UK. We're complaining that what PayPal did to me, uh, the Free Speech Union and the Daily Skeptic, was a breach of the existing regulations, which which require payment processors to give customers adequate notice if they're going to close their accounts, as well as um, uh, an adequate explanation as to why they're doing it, which they didn't in our case. So we think that that was a breach of the regulations, but we're also lobbying the Treasury to change the regulations to make it more difficult for payment processors like PayPal to close the accounts of people for purely political reasons, even if they give them adequate notice and an adequate explanation. Uh, I think this is a real problem. It isn't just a problem in the UK. Um, the Chinese style social credit system is being rolled out across the West in which um, another tool to try and enforce conformity with orthodox narratives is to threaten people with being financially debanked um, if they if they express unconventional, unorthodox, dissenting opinions, um, and uh, we need to nip this in the bud. We need to, if we can, persuade our governments to make it illegal, because if we don't do that, then um, we'll all be at the mercy of these woke companies based in California. My last question is going back to the interview with you on Spiked, where you discussed the question why so many liberals have given up free speech. And my question added to this is, what can we do to bring them back? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, I think part of the explanation must be that the liberal left, uh, when it was outside the establishment, when it was agitating for political change, um, prized free speech and championed free speech because free speech protected the liberal left. Without free speech, the liberal left couldn't make its case in the public square. And the existence of free speech was absolutely critical to various victories that the liberal left has won over the past hundred years or so. Um, women's rights, civil rights, gay rights. Uh, without, without free speech, they wouldn't have been able to win any of those victories. Um, but now that they are in the ascendancy, now that the liberal left has become the establishment, um, they, they no longer have a vested interest in defending free speech. On the contrary, Uh, it's now something that's made use of more often by their opponents, by conservatives. So they've become much more lukewarm about defending it. Um, and I think the way to uh, restore um, uh, uh, their 
support for free speech is is to persuade them that even though things may be going their way at the moment, um, think the wind could change, the political wind could change, and things might start going the way of conservatives, um, and as they as they are in some countries, uh, particularly in Central Europe. Um, and when that happens, it will be in the interest of the liberal left to defend free speech again. So I think we need to persuade them that um, it's very short sighted uh, to um, abandon the cause of free speech just because they're winning at the moment. The wind can change and um, then they'll need free speech again. So that, that's the argument we have to win. Thank you very much, Toby, for your time and insight. I hope to see you soon live in Prague. Absolutely. Well, I'd, I'd love to visit and uh, congratulations on all the great work you're doing and best of luck. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.